Mini PCs are fun. Don't get me wrong, I like powerful custom builds as much as anyone else, but there's something appealing about these tiny form factors, especially when they pack a surprising amount of power. This one has an 8-core Ryzen 7 APU, upgradable RAM and storage, and costs less than £300 or dollars right now. So, what's the catch? The AM02 Pro by Nipoji, or Camrui in the US, packs some pretty excellent specs for its size and price point. The APU is a Ryzen 7 5700U, which, despite its name, is a Zen 2-based 8-core CPU with simultaneous multi-threading, an 8MB L3 cache, clocks up to 4.3GHz, and a TDP of 15 watts. In fact, it's not a million miles from the CPU element of the current gen consoles. However, don't let that get your hopes up. The integrated graphics are still based on Vega, with 8 compute units clocked at up to 1.9GHz. And while the shared memory is at least dual channel DDR4-3200, you shouldn't expect console levels of gaming performance here. The base retail price of the AM02 Pro is £400, which would be quite a stretch for tech that's now a couple of generations old, but like I said in the intro, this is actually available for under £300. Nipoji have provided a discount code which brings the cost down to just £279. Viewers in the US can use their code to bring that down to almost $260. For that price, you get 16 gigs of RAM, a 512 gig NVMe SSD, and Windows 11 pre-installed. But is it even worth this discounted price? Well, the exterior certainly packs a decent range of ports. On the front, we have a USB-C and 3.5mm combo jack, as well as a nice clicky power button. The rear side features three USB 3 Type A holes and one USB 2, as well as full size HDMI and display ports, a barrel jack for power and a gigabit Ethernet port, backed up by Wi Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 on board. The front panel USB C port appears to be data only, so no power or display over Type C in this case. It's also not a Thunderbolt port, so there's no easy eGPU connectivity either. Internally, things are fairly upgradable. Both RAM sticks are socketed, as is the SSD, though there's only that single M.2 socket for internal storage. I did spot a SATA data port, but apparently this is for debugging purposes. Still, if you don't mind performing the SSD upgrade or living on external drives, this has the potential to be the basis of a pretty decent media center PC or home file server. Connectivity and upgradability aside then, I think it's time to look at some benchmarks. Starting with the synthetics, and I need you to temper your expectations here. The 15 watt TDP for this chip is for the whole thing, graphics included. On the few occasions where the CPU runs at close to its boost speed, temperatures soar into the high 80s. This is rare, however, and most of the time things remain under control, staying well under 80 degrees but that means the clock speeds don't go very high. The CPU Z benchmark is only a few seconds long, and yet it can drop from the high 4400s to below 4K in that time. I took an average of 10 runs and found a multi-core average of 4067 and a single core score of 522, putting it about 10% behind an i7-8700K running at 4.5 GHz. Cinebench R23 is a more intensive test, running the same render on repeat for 10 minutes, and so the 5700U actually remains far more consistent. After the first completed render, it scored 7554, and by the end of the 10 minutes, that had only dropped as far as 7418. This result is a fair amount behind the 8700K, and is instead closer to a Haswell 6 core. The single thread result was 1236, which is actually pretty good for Zen 2. 3D Mark tests bring in the GPU to the equation, and while you're not going to be blown away, these are good numbers considering the price and the 15 watt TDP. Firestrike has an overall score of 3536, with the CPU scoring 17460 and the GPU at 3919. TimeSpy has an overall score of 1409, with the CPU at 6336, and the GPU at 1239. I won't be publishing my 12th gen i7 mini PC review for a couple more weeks, but... Spoiler? 
it's a lot closer than you might expect. On to productivity and the resolve results are a mixed bag. The H.264 CPU render estimated 22 minutes to render a 5 minute 4K 60 clip, but by the time it had finished that had dragged out to 27 minutes 20 seconds, actually slightly slower than an Intel N100 in the same test. The H.265 render however uses the GPU and this was much faster. The 5700U completed in just under 10 minutes, only a minute slower than the much newer Ryzen 7 7840HX with RDNA 3 graphics. With all that being said, the iGPU still isn't optimal for working on a 4K timeline, so if you want to use the AM02 Pro for video editing, you'll either want to stick to 1080p or else work with proxies. Blender isn't quite as successful on the 5700U as it doesn't support GPU acceleration with Radeons. The CPU can complete the classroom render in just over 12 minutes, about 50% longer than the neutered 13th gen i9 in a mini PC and 2 minutes behind a desktop 8700K. Still, it's way faster than a lot of older desktop chips and even the 6 and 8 core Xeons for the X99 platform. But that's enough grown up stuff. How does it game? Obviously, after all those 3D Mark results, we're not expecting a gaming powerhouse, but there's still fun to be had. Apex Legends requires dropping to 900p and low settings, and on my 1440p screen that does make it look a bit like I need glasses, but the gameplay itself isn't bad at all. Average FPS breaks past 60, and 1% lows are still up in the 50s. Battlebit Remastered is usually a win for low spec machines, and at 1080p potato quality, the AM02 Pro is no exception. Averages break past 80 FPS, and 1% lows are hovering around the 60 mark. Honestly, if I didn't hate this genre with a burning passion, I think I could have a good time here. Counter Strike 2 is a little more demanding than I think some people would like and I have to count myself among them this time. At 1080 low, I would normally turn off the default FSR upscaling, but doing so makes for a genuinely painful experience. Adding FSR quality is just enough to make things acceptable without ruining visibility, but averages at these settings almost reach 60, but lows are still very low. Straight out of the gate, Fortnite is disappointing, even in performance mode. There simply isn't enough power to go around when both the CPU and GPU are being battered like this, so hitching and stuttering never quite goes away. Despite the 70 FPS average, those sub-cinematic 1% lows make things pretty unplayable. That doesn't mean you can't improve them, however. Adding a 60 FPS cap seems to take some of the strain off the CPU, and while it's not a locked 60, it still gives a much smoother experience, with 1% lows now in the low 40s. Overwatch 2 is a better time, but some sacrifices still have to be made to get things running even close to smoothly. The game is more GPU bound, and so while 1080 low is too much to hope for, Dropping resolution has the desired effect. At 75% scaling, the AM02 Pro achieves a 70 plus average and 1% lows in the high 40s. GTA 5 also works out remarkably well here. At 1080 normal, with crowd settings at about halfway and advanced settings disabled, we're looking at a near 60 average and lows in the high 40s. Some resolution tweaks and maybe reducing crowd variety, and you could probably get a locked 60 if you wanted. I run the Civilization 6 AI benchmark as essentially one last CPU specific synthetic test, and it's one that most mini PCs never do very well in. The AM02 Pro continues the trend, completing it with an average turn time of just 8.79 seconds. Faster than a 4th gen i3, but not by much. 
Finally, I quickly ran through a handful of emulators to see if it was up to the task, and I was pleasantly surprised. PCSX2 can run Gran Turismo 4 with three times upscaling at a near perfect 60 FPS, and dropping the upscaling amount would be all that's needed to guarantee 60. CMU runs Mario Kart 8 quite superbly at 1080p, with only the occasional visual glitch when stages are loading up. And not only is that glitch pretty common, I've seen it take far longer to clear up on lesser CPUs than this one. The only disappointing test was Rogue Leader. This one really taxes CPUs and every explosion or scene transition brought with it a greater or lesser amount of stutter. So, where is the catch? I mean, there really isn't one, all things considered. It doesn't match the latest and greatest Ryzen 7000 machines, though it gets pretty close to some of the 12th and 13th gen Intels, whose architectural advantages are offset by the need to throttle back under load. With total system power consumption maxing out at about 36 watts, and idle consumption at about 16, this isn't all that much thirstier than an Intel N100, and when compared to the chip we're not calling a Celeron, in most games the Ryzen 5700U blows it away. With roughly 50% higher power consumption overall, the Ryzen system scores about 50% higher in single-threaded benchmarks, over three times higher in multi-threaded tests, and is significantly better in games and emulation. While there's not a catch per se, there are a few disappointing downsides. Gaming performance might be impressive for a 15 watt part, but in a wider context it's still a shame to see that it couldn't do any better. There is what appears to be some level of TDP control in the BIOS, but it didn't seem to have any positive effect, and the package never really passed 22 watts. The lack of Thunderbolt means no eGPU support, and with the only M.2 slot occupied with the only storage drive, you'll struggle to make a DIY solution work too, so anyone looking to turn this efficient little mini PC into a gaming beast will be disappointed. All that being said, at under £300, the AMO2 Pro is actually only slightly more expensive than the last N100 system I tested, and unless you need the lowest power consumption possible, I think that makes it a pretty compelling choice. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.